Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's second webinar in this four-part series called People and Place, hosted by the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. My name is Diane Shalfont, and I am a volunteer and board member of the Yellowstone Gateway Museum here in Livingston, Montana. Our museum is a tremendous resource for the community, and so much of it can be accessed online, like the program you'll be seeing tonight. So we encourage you, if you're not currently a member, to become a member of the museum and really learn more about the natural and cultural heritage of, of Park County, Montana and Livingston. In a moment, I'll introduce tonight's speaker, Karen Reinhardt, but first I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items that'll help you know how to participate in today's event. At any time during the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions and your questions will be anonymous. And in order to ask questions, just use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. I'll read the questions and at the end of the program, give Karen an opportunity to respond to them once her, once her presentation is over. Um, we will be recording this webinar and we'll be uploading it to the Yellowstone Gateway Museum's YouTube channel. So you can view it again after the event or tell friends who haven't seen it about it. And then finally, the webinar afterwards, you'll have an opportunity to take a short survey. And we encourage you to take the survey because it'll help us improve this webinar series. Um, there are two more webinars in this series in April, next Wednesday, uh, April 21st, Kelly Hartman presents A Brief History of Cook City. And the week after that, April 28th, Paul Shea presents Livingston and Park County and Early History. So we hope you'll join us. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Karen Reinhardt is a native of central Montana and she's worked for 30 years in area museums. She worked for the National Park Service as an interpreter in Yellowstone National Park and as a curator of education and outreach at the Jackson Hole Historical Society and Museum. And she's currently the curator at the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. Karen brings, um, Karen manages the museum's collections. She develops and designs exhibits, including these virtual offerings. She gives education programs and manages the, the museum's website and um, and posts, uh, including glimmers of history. She invites people to share their stories through oral histories or written accounts. Karen believes that the stories make an area's history more relevant and more interesting. Karen is also the author of two interpretive history books about Yellowstone. One is Old Faithful Inn, Crown Jewel of the National Park Lodges. And the other is Yellowstone Rebirth by Fire, Rising from the Ashes of the 1988 Wildfires. Karen's published many articles about the natural and cultural history of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. She lives near Gardner with her daughter, Mariah. Now, sit back, relax, and enjoy Montana's history. Please welcome Karen Reinhardt. Karen? Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful introduction and all of your hard work on these series, Diane. Sure. I am going to share my screen and begin our my PowerPoint program. Okay, Montana women making do and making a difference. This program includes a lot of stories of hardworking women, but in no way does it include all of them. There are many other stories that I'm familiar with and um, I'm sure that you know stories as well, and perhaps you'll be able to uh, contact me with some of those stories after the program. Some of these women coaxed a living off the land. Some worked outside the home in traditional female roles, and others were trailblazers in non-traditional endeavors. Many of the stories threads you will realize include education. And of course, each of these women, when they returned home, if they were earning a wage and were away from home for the day, they had piles of work. Not so different from our fast paced lives today as we try to juggle our many roles and also consider the needs of our families, never mind our own needs. Many women lived or still live in Montana and made a difference for people in their communities, the state and in some cases beyond, as Jeanette Rankin did. 
Jeanette Rankin was the first woman elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1916, representing Montana. A feminist and pacifist, she voted against our country's involvement in World War I and World War II and protested against the Vietnam War. Her spunk and verb and commitment are legendary. But I find the stories of virtually unknown, extraordinary, ordinary women to be more interesting and easier perhaps for us to emulate. It is these women that I honor and celebrate today. Frederick and Josie Butler were some of the first settlers in what would become Park County arriving in immigrant Montana in 1867 and starting a ranch and guide service. Now, of course, they actually arrived in the immigrant area as they were here before immigrant was established. Early tourists and dignitaries stopped at the ranch on their way to or return from Yellowstone National Park. In 1881, their daughter Maud Butler was born, the first white girl born in our country. But that's not the most exciting thing about her. She was one of the first female painters in the area, if not the first, expressing her creativity in a way that was at that time reserved for women. We know that she met Thomas Moran, the famous painter whose paintings helped establish the park and likely influenced her own work. Maude painted mostly with watercolors, but these pastel paintings, now in the museum's collection, are dated April 4th, 1899. She was truly a pioneer of artistic expression. Sarah Gammon Bickford was born to parents who were slaves. They were sold when she was young, and she never saw them again. In 1871, after the Civil War granted her freedom, Sarah moved to Virginia City in Montana Territory, where she was employed as a nanny working for a judge. She later married and had three children, but her husband beat her, threatened to kill her, and then deserted her. She, she divorced him, which was not an easy thing to do in those days. Then all of her children died, victims of pneumonia and diphtheria. She remarried, and when her second husband died, she became the sole owner of the town's water company. Sarah had begun, begun life as a slave, and as author Ellen Baumler wrote, she stepped out of her accepted domestic role to become a top-notch businesswoman. Sarah was inducted into the gallery of outstanding Montanans in the Capitol Rotunda in Helena in 2012. Another Sarah, Sarah Millard Schultz, better known as Aunt Sarah, moved to Clark City in 1882 with her first husband. Now Clark City was Livingston's predecessor town consisting of shacks that had been assembled on the eastern edge of today's town along the Yellowstone River. Their son, Orson Abel, was the first white child born in Livingston on March 13, 1883. While employed as a watchman and car tender at the depot, 19-year-old Orson was scalded to death when a passenger car's oil heater exploded. Sarah had to take in boarders because her husband did not provide for their family, and eventually she divorced him and went to work managing the county poor farm, which was located east of Livingston. Sarah later remarried and then trained as a nurse and midwife attendant. Aunt Sarah took care of expectant mothers and their households before and during um, birth, staying on for at least 10 days. Later, she carried, cared for mothers at her Calendar Street home, even after she became deaf. In that same year, Ellen Robinson was the first graduate nurse to practice in Park County. Because there were no hospitals, doctors and nurses traveled to wherever people lived or worked. She was a private nurse in Livingston for a few years, then worked as a nurse in Spokane, returning home to Park County after she was widowed with two sons to raise. Ellen owned and operated a hospital in Wilsell for seven years before moving to Livingston where she operated a hospital and nursing home in two locations. Ellen specialized in maternity cases and retired when she was 77 years old after 46 years of taking care of people. 
Many of you probably know or have heard of Michael Ann Kaywood Berg and her contributions to women's health care in Southwest Montana and beyond. She retired a few years ago after 33 years of service as a certified nurse midwife. Always on call, Michael Ann provided prenatal and postnatal care, helping mothers bring about 1,400 children into the world. She's shown here with my newborn son, Forrest, in 1995. Remarkable, hardworking women live and work among us today. Elizabeth D. Sandy Sandelius is one of only 18 female World War I veterans from Montana honored in a national cemetery. She was born in Cokedale, west of Livingston in 1893. Sandy graduated from St. John's Hospital Nursing School in Helena and entered the US Army Nurse Corps in Columbus, Montana in 1917. She served in a base hospital in Kansas and then went to France in 1918. Sandy served with the American Expeditionary Force, the 28th Infantry Division, and refused to leave during the eight, day, eight days that German pilots bombed the field hospital where she worked. The commanding general cited her for heroism under fire, commending her splendid spirit of self-sacrifice, courage, and devotion to duty, helping wounded officers and soldiers convalesce. Sandy qualified for the Citation Star, now Silver Star Medal. A December 1919 Great Falls Tribune article stated that she indeed was awarded the French Croix de Guerre for actions under fire. Like Sandy, Mary Jane D Davies was born in a coal mining town. Aldridge was built in the 1880s north of Yellowstone National Park near Gardner. Residents mined coke and coal for the Anaconda Mining Company until 1910. Note the school in the foreground, in the left foreground. This is where Mary Jane taught primary grades in Aldridge for seven and one half years. Her classroom averaged more than 50 students. I think that deserves an award just, just for that. That's a lot of lesson plans. During her tenure there in 1904, she ran for the Office of County Superintendent of Schools and won by only one vote. They then held a recount and another Aldridge teacher, Nora Colvin, was declared the winner by five votes. Mary Jane left Aldridge with a letter of recommendation, now in the museum's collection, and continued teaching in Montana until 1949, a 50-year career of making a difference. Here's another story about education. Edna Faye Kaiser traveled with her family to Montana by covered wagon in 1888. She and her husband homesteaded on Flathead Creek west of Wilsall. For a few years, Edna taught in one-room schoolhouses. Education was very important to the family, so they sold the ranch and moved to Livingston so that their 10 children could attend school. In 1917, Governor Sam Stewart gave Edna a $100 Liberty Bond, today about $1,900, because she was the first mother in the state to have three sons voluntarily enlist during World War I. Forty years later, to honor her contributions to the building of the West, the National Cowboy Hall of Fame issued Edna a certificate of charter membership. And in 1976, she was one of 10 mothers from Montana whose stories were highlighted in the book, Mothers of Achievement in American History, 1776 to 1976. This is a huge book, over 600 pages, and she was honored in it. Fanny Cullum, and I can't help it. Every time I see her, I think of Glenn Close. Um, she was born in the South during the Civil War. When she was 19 years old, she married William Officer in Tennessee. They soon boarded a train to Missouri, bought a wagon and a team of mules, procured supplies and joined a wagon train headed for Bozeman. In fall 1887, the family rented the Hunter's Hot Springs Hotel near Springdale, east of Livingston. Fanny worked very hard there. She cooked for guests and put on long underwear, heavy clothing 
and a coat to clean their unheated rooms. The family turned to sheep and cattle ranching, but eventually sold their critters and instead purchased the hotel in 1893, which they lost during the financial panic of that year. But they owned the store in a two room log cabin outright, so that helped to keep their family going. After William died in 1911, Fanny operated the businesses while raising their five children. Later, when her daughter died, leaving four children, Fanny raised those grandchildren as well. She was also the Hunter Hot Springs postmaster for nearly 30 years. And here's the story of a woman who was successful at many vocations. In the early days, students didn't go to school for a nine month term as today, but only went to school for three months, often in the summer. Percy Matheson taught 11 terms at the Chico School beginning in 1888. She married minor Bill Knowles two years later and they built a house near the hot springs. Percy ran a boarding house for 12 single men who worked in the area which earned important cash. The Knowles borrowed $7,000, today it's about $190,000, to build a hotel near the springs, a circular plunge pool, and private baths, which opened to the public June 20th, 1900. Percy managed the kitchen, the garden, which was very large, and was also known for the kindness that she showed her female employees. She became sole manager of the hotel and the ranch operations in 1910 when Bill died. Percy closed the saloon at that time, and this was eight years before the onset of Prohibition, which turned Chico into a health resort. She convinced Dr. George Townsend to become the spa's resident physician. Percy was very successful as Chico's development and reputation grew over the next 13 years. But in 1925, the doctor left, business began to wane, as did Percy's health. Then the Great Depression took its toll. She lived at Warm Springs State Hospital for four and one half years, dying there in 1940. Today, of course, her legacy lives on in Chico Hot Springs. In this photo, before I go to the next slide, you can see the really large garden um, kind of in the center right. Edna Link was born in 1897 in Gardner. She attended grade school there, but had to travel to Livingston to continue her education at Park High, graduating in 1916. Edna wanted to go to college in Bozeman to become a teacher, but her father wouldn't allow her. He believed that women should only be housewives and mothers. Edna married Clarence Lauer in 1918, and they settled on a ranch in Tom Minor Basin. But the family decided to move back to, to Gardner so that their daughter could attend school. Edna worked for the Gardner Electric Light and Water Company it was on, and was on the school board. Her daughter remembered. On the first day of school every year, mom would get out her wrenches and come to school. The old wooden desks and seats were bolted to the floor. She made sure that every boy and girl's feet were on the floor and that each desk was in its proper place. Edna's biggest contribution to education, though, was her and others' hard work. Toward establishing a high school in Gardner, she made many trips to Livingston to persuade voters there to create a separate school district, which of course would reduce money available to the Livingston School District, but eventually she won out. The first student graduated from Gardner High School in 1939. Margaret Carlston was a real character of Park County history and was known as the Cattle Queen. She immigrated to America in the 1870s from Sweden. And in 1878, Margaret and her husband, Richard, worked their way west, spending nine years at Deadwood in the Black Hills of South Dakota. She reportedly knew Wild Bill Hickok and Calamity Jane, another character who once lived near Livingston, or in Livingston, actually. And she's a little too famous for this particular talk, but she has many stories to tell. In 1887, on their way to Silver City near Helena, a group of Crow Indians untied her prized saddle horse, Prince, from the back of their wagon. Margaret sent her husband after the horse, but when he didn't return, she left the two children in the wagon and went to investigate. And this is what she saw. 
she saw her husband jumping on the back of a stolen horse, and then the Indian men would push him off. And they repeated this antic over and over again. So Margaret walked up, jumped on the horse, and rode off, leaving the Native people apparently so astonished that they just let her go. And then her husband followed. Margaret earned her cattle queen title by buying cattle and building a herd. In 1903, the Carlstons drove 400 to 500 head of cattle to their newly purchased ranch on Elbow Creek, about 15 miles south of Livingston. The cattle queen was tough, but also known for her generosity. She brought baked goods and fresh garden produce to Livingston train crews who would hold a train for her if she was running late doing errands and conducting business in Livingston. Josephine Klein, another strong woman. She moved to Livingston in 1905 and built a small hotel and cafe on the corner of Park and Second Streets. She was the first woman to own an automobile in town. Josephine expanded her hotel in 1920 and named it the Klein Hotel. Uh, it was financed via a handshake with new cap capitalist John or J.A. Murray um, but unfortunately, Murray died the next year and his heir foreclosed the property and Josephine served two days in jail for refusing to leave the hotel. She fought Murray's heir in court for years before she ultimately lost everything. And just after the end of the Great Depression in 1934, Josephine and her sister, Annie, shown here in the, in the photo, hitchhiked to Washington, D.C. when they were in their 60s with only about $14 in their pocket today, about $250, in order to petition President Roosevelt for help with their legal troubles, placing them on the front page of the Washington Post, but it didn't help. Many Montanans suffered hard times during the Great Depression. This early 1930s story is one of making do. Beatrice McIntyre Murray and her husband made their first home in Brainerd, Minnesota. The Murrays and many other families would line up railroad car doors, like four of them, put them together, uh, fashion a roof um, on top, insulating it with corrugated pasteboard and somehow making it into a home. Years later, because her husband had no work, the family piled all of their belong belongings into a railroad boxcar, including their horses, and rode their, the rails west to a better life. Her husband was allowed, allowed to ride in the boxcar with the horses in order to care for them, but she and her son had to burrow under the hay in order to um, gain passage and to avoid detection. Their end of the line was Roy, Montana, a tiny central Montana home. They unloaded and made their way to a half section of land that they had purchased to begin a cattle ranch. The Murrays settled in an old log house with no water or electricity, no panes of glass in the windows and a hole on, in the roof. And then their humble home burned to the ground nine years later and they lost everything. While they were building a, another modest log house, again without plumbing because they still didn't have water, they lived in a sheep wagon, which was miserably cold in the winter. Beatrice also worked outside the home in a small cafe in Roy. When local author Donna Gray interviewed 92-year-old Beatrice in 1988, she was still carrying water into her house, heating it on the wood stove, and then carrying it out to the metal shed to dump it into her bathtub to take a bath. Amazing. In 1914, Bertha Gonder left Kentucky when her husband died. She headed west as a single mother with nine children to support. In May 1918, during World War I, Bertha and 30 other women started working at the Northern Pacific Railway shops in Livingston when the railroad could not find enough men to keep the wheels of the trains rolling. The women were hired to clean the dirty, coal-burning steam locomotive engines they were soon blackened from soot and referred to as the Dirty Dozen. After the war was over, Bertha continued to clean engines until after World War II. And then at that time, she was promoted to roundhouse bookkeeper and train crew coordinator. 
Bertha retired in 1948 after 30 years of service. The Fort Shaw girls basketball team was a group of young women from several different tribes. They were forced to attend a boarding school near Great Falls. The federal government opened this off-reservation boarding school to remove children from their tribal communities in order to assimilate them into white people's culture. The students were trained for domestic service, farming and industrial labor. Most of the young girls were daughters of indigenous women and white men, and many had lost their mothers, fathers, and siblings either before or during their time at Fort Shaw. Despite these horrible hardships, the girls were champions at the World's Fair in St. Louis, Missouri in 1904. Fort Shaw closed six years later in 1910. Eloise Cobell was given warrior status by the Blackfeet tribe in 2002, and she deserved no less. She was treasurer for the tribe and founder of the first American Indian owned national bank. Through an act signed in 1887, the US government had promised to pay tribal members for the lease of their allotments. But over the years, Eloise discovered that native people had received only negligible sums of money. She began investigating their claims and in 1983, she filed a class action suit on behalf of one half million native people against the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of Interior, seeking as much as $127 billion. In 1996, 13 years after the filing of her suit, the Secretary of the Interior settled the case for $3.4 billion. She had worked hard for all Indian people, doing something no one else knew how to do or had the energy to do. She's a great example. We can all be warriors standing up for what we know is right in our families, our schools, our communities, our great state of Montana and beyond. Doris Whithorn was a history champion she moved to Montana with her husband, Bill, in 1939. They purchased and operated the Wanigan Roadside Store and Cabins on the East River Road south of Livingston in 1954, which was the same year that Bill began copying photographs from area old timers. Doris documented the stories behind the photos and was instrumental in forming the Park County um, Museum Association in 1964. She was the Yellowstone Gateway Museum's first director, serving from 1973 until 1997, 24 years. Through her tireless efforts and insatiable curiosity, she researched, wrote, and published local history books, 12 with Bill and nine after he died. The museum has extensive archival, photograph, library, and object collections, largely because of Doris with Whithorn and her vision for the preserving the history of Park County. Why have I shared these particular women's stories? Well, because someone wrote them down. Whether male or female, you have a story to tell. We all do. A legacy of how you served your family, your community, and beyond. I invite you to write your own story and also conduct interviews of your family members or friends. Ask questions while they still remember the details. Each of these women in the stories I shared today defied the odds, embraced change, and made a difference while protecting their families. If you know a strong woman, support her. If you are a woman, lead. If you have a daughter or granddaughter, encourage her. This will ensure that strong women will continue to inspire future generations. A special thanks to the people who have researched and wrote women's stories. And if you have a story to share or archive at the museum, please email me or call me. My information is at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'd love to include more women's stories in my next program. So thank you very much. I appreciate your kind attention.
Well, thank you, Karen. That was a fascinating program. And um, I'm wondering if um, some of the people in the audience are related to some of the people who you, um, who you profiled today. Uh, we did have a question um, about that Brownstone um, School in Gardner in 1903. And the question is, is that building still there? And uh, where was it located? I don't believe that it is still there. And I am not sure. I'm not certain where it is. With a little research, I could come up with an address or the, the street. So yeah, that's that would be interesting. I'm sure a lot of people would like to know that. And um, you know, we certainly have thanks from the audience members. Are there any other questions? Is there anyone in this group? Oh, we've got a few more questions. Let's see here. Um, so what happened to the Klein Hotel? Another question. Well, the Klein Ho Hotel became the Murray Hotel. So it's the same hotel okay. that we have today on the corner of 2nd and uh, Park Streets. Great. Another comment, uh, another great resource is um, a publication called Staking Her Claim, Women Homesteaders by Marsha Hensley. So that's another great resource. I for... think I have that book and I should look at that. Great. Again, anybody in this audience, oh, more questions coming in. Um, Let's see, the woman violinist who had the melody, is that the same melody still sitting empty in the canyon uh, south of town? Yes, I believe it is. And it has been empty for many, many years now, at least 20 years, maybe 30, mm -hmm. long time. Well. Any other questions? Anyone watching related to one of the women that um, Karen talked about today? Let's see what we got. Another question, do you know more of the history of that club? Oh, of and the Melody? Uh, melody yeah, the mel club? yes, the Melody. Mm -hmm. So there's a great book that is available that the museum has republished called Park County History 1984 or the history of Park County 1984, that's the name of it. Mm -hmm. And it's a great book. And in that book, it does give a history of the supper club and who the various owners are. That book is available at the museum as well as Park Photo uh, in downtown Livingston. And it has an index, it has an index. So it's easy to look up um, family names or business names. Great. Okay, any other questions? Let's I see, want, like we got... You have another question? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so the the re regarding the Gardner School, um, the school is no longer existing. It was at the east end of Park Street near the current Confluence Park. Ah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. That's great. I really want to encourage people to submit their stories of strong women or strong men for that matter, or you don't even have to be strong. Um, <laughs> the museum is, is very interested in stories um, of residents um, and you know people who have made a difference in various ways in Park County. So please feel free to email me or give me a call. You know, your program just gives so many different jumping off points um, of areas of interest, whether it's railroad history or um, the history of education or the uh, Native American history. There's just so many different um, perspectives or just the idea of people who moved to Montana and where they came from and the, the, the incredible um, hardships that they faced um, coming here. So it was really fascinating. Okay, well, if we don't have any more questions, um, again, I wanna thank you, Karen, for the great program and thank all of you who were uh, in our audience tonight for watching and just wanna remind you that uh, we have two more programs uh, in this series, the next two Wednesday nights, and you can register for them um, on the museum's Facebook page um, and or at the website and uh, the programs will be uploaded on the YouTube channel. Looks like we got one last one that just came in. Let's see. Oh, someone asked, <laughs> an old friend asked, 
when did you start at the museum? Uh, December 2012. Okay. Great. Thank All you. Right. Everyone. All right. Thanks again. And we hope to see you next week.